about one o'clock in the afternoon, and um, I was uh, driving uh, the vehicle, the work vehicle at the time, and my passenger um, spotted something uh, off on his side, on the right hand side, and um, we drove right by whatever it was, and he was hesitant to tell me what that was. Park rangers and forest officials have stories that have seemed to capture all of your imagination so much. All the support on this series has been overwhelming, and I can't thank you guys enough. I also want to thank everybody for sending in more of their park ranger stories. If you have a story that you would like to hear on this channel, send it to the email. You can find it in the description below. In the summer of 1987, I was a Fred Harvey employee at Grand Canyon National Park, who after my summer contract was up, I signed on to work over the winter for Fred Harvey. Right after New Year's Eve of 1988, I was moving into a company housing with my roommate. He was a very evangelical Christian guy named Dave. He was pretty weird and used to cast practically everybody except him into hell. He would stand in Missowak Lodge and pronounce that 98% of the people we could see were going to hell. But not him. Never him. After moving to company housing on the second floor and on the west end of the building facing the Grand Canyon, there was a knock at the door and I answered it. I found a deputy sheriff and two SWAT cops in full body armor. The deputy sheriff informed me that they had a crisis situation and we had to evacuate the building immediately. After putting on my boots and going outside, I saw a sharpshooter across the street on the balcony of another company housing for employees building. I could see him sighting something or someone, and then not anymore. They appeared to be on hold your fire stance for the moment. Freaking out and wondering, really wondering what's going on, Dave and I thought it was a major drug bust. Back in 1986 and 1987, if you didn't use drugs, you were in the strong minority. Everybody used recreational drugs at the Grand Canyon, and I mean everybody. That's why I and super religious Dave were roommates. Neither one of us used drugs. Dave used to, but he stopped and got sober and super religious. Everybody was going to hell, but me and him, he was certain. Anyway, after leaving the building and seeing what I thought was a sharpshooter on hold your fire status, we went down to the end of the street, and since it was cold out, we were told that we could sit in the emergency police vehicles nearby. So Dave and I did, and we could hear the radio traffic going back and forth, as they were getting ready to storm one of the employee apartments in the building we just evacuated, on orders. There was a roll call to see who was in position, and if they could see anything. Radio traffic kept coming back that it was negative. They couldn't see anything and the sharpshooter didn't have a shot he could take because the curtains were closed was why. Now, both of us were really, really freaking out and wondering what the hell was going on. Super religious Dave thought that the devil was in control and maundering around the Grand Canyon. It was obvious, totally obvious. No kidding, I thought. You might be right, super religious Dave. This time, anyway. After roll call and everyone was in position, the sharpshooter came over the radio and said he still didn't have a shot. There was a countdown in the signal. Everybody in. It's a go. It's a go. Everybody in. And then, radio silence. Absolute radio silence. Not another word came over the radio for several long minutes. The devil was in control. It's clear. It's real clear. Super religious Dave was sure of it. No shit! I felt like saying, but it's super religious Dave, so I didn't want to curse or use profanity, then I'd also be going to hell too. That would make it clear. Now, in conclusion, it was not a major drug bust at the Grand Canyon. Two employees at the time, of Fred Harvey, had kidnapped an 11 year old girl in Phoenix, brought her back up to the national park and were holding her in their room, on the east side of the building and the floor below us. Me and super religious Dave were pretty freaked out. The police got the girl back, but one of the kidnappers had briefly gotten away and was on the run for a little while. Before he was captured, 
Super Religious Dave and I were shocked and surprised, but we adjusted to it. By the way, that happened right as I was taken at knife point, briefly, from one of my other employees in the residence, by a drugged up employee at Fred Harvey, who kept telling me that I needed to pay him $80. He needed $80, or he was going to stab me and cut my eyes out. I guess it's just another day at Grand Canyon National Park over the winter of 1987. For as long as I can remember, I've loved to be in the woods. At the time this story happened, I was 18 and had just convinced my parents to let me go camping alone. Keep in mind that I am around a 5'5 woman, in shape, but I like to think that I'm not an idiot. I had planned the trip to be about 4 days long, and I packed accordingly, and let my family know which general area I would be in. Back then, I didn't have my concealed carry and my only weapons were a small pocket knife and a machete. Looking back, I'm seriously questioning my not an idiot assertion. I don't care who you are, but going on a lone camping trip with no guns is a stupid thing to do. Anyway, I was about two days into my hike and decided to set up camp beside an outcropping of rocks. At this point, I had seen some signs of other people, but they looked pretty old and I wasn't really concerned. As I'm setting up, I keep getting the feeling someone's watching me, but when I go to check, I never see anyone. Unsettled, but undeterred, I settle in for the night. I woke up abruptly, at what seemed to be only a few minutes later, to the sound of people walking around my campsite. I froze, and listened. It sounded like at least three men, and from their crazed speech, I thought they were probably on drugs. I quietly put on my jacket and boots, gathered up my courage, grabbed my machete and unzipped my tent and threw myself out. They all turned to face me and I could tell they had all been in the woods for a while. They were thin, dirty and almost feral looking and they were terrifying. I don't know if it was instinct or God that told me to run, to not try to scare them away, but I just know if I stayed, I would have died there. They lunged at me and one managed to grab the back of me, my jacket. I, I screamed and hacked at his arm and he yelled and dropped me. I ran and they chased me nearly catching up multiple times as I tore through the brush, gaining more cuts as I went. Somehow, I was able to escape them and hid under a fallen tree, trembling and crying silently. At dawn, I started making my way towards civilization and luckily my jacket had some power bars and a small water bottle in it. I walked about a day before stumbling into a camp of a couple. I must have looked like a fright and after explaining what happened, they called the rangers for me. The rangers got there and took me back to my campsite, and of course, most of my stuff was gone. After searching the area thoroughly and finding the blood from one of the guy's arms, they took me back. The rangers never caught the guys, and apparently, that kind of attack happened to single hikers quite a bit in that area. I'm older and wiser now, and though I still go on camping trips, I rarely go alone, and I always bring a gun now. One year, a group of us went camping in Kearney, Ontario, where we always go camping. Whenever we go, we always form our tents in a big circle, with the fire pit in the middle of us. We've been drinking, smoking a few joints, and a few of us tripping balls on shrooms. The first night we were there, this guy randomly walks into our circle, introduces himself, I can't remember the name he gave, that he was in the military and decided to take some vacation to camp out a bit. He asked if he could join our fire, as it was getting late and he didn't buy any firewood. Being the friendly stoned people we are, we let him join our fire. He even pitched in some money for the firewood. The night went on, and we all were having a good time. One by one, our group started heading off to bed. Me being either the second or third. I remember waking up to the sound of someone talking and the fire being started. It was four in the morning. I peeped out my tent and saw the random just sitting on the log by the fire, talking to himself. Still tripping on shrooms, I thought to myself. I am in no condition to deal with this and chalked it up to me just tripping out. I wake up the next day and everyone is still alive, thankfully, and the fire is smoldering. We look at the campsite where the random guy was staying and it was spotless, 
No garbage, no tracks in the trail around the site, no nothing. We all started talking about him, just to be sure we all saw him. Through talking, we managed to figure out that he must not have slept at all, and the last two of our group passed out at 3.30 a.m. The first person got up just after 6 a.m. and noticed he was gone. The rest of the camping trip went well, and we all went home. Fast forward maybe four to five years, I flip on the news and there's this picture of someone I could swear I recognize. He was arrested for a bunch of crimes, including rape and murder. Guess who it was? It was the random guy who joined our fire. I don't know why I remembered his face, but I guess it was just a weird situation where my brain right clicked, saved as a JPEG in my brain. Now, I have no way of proving it was the same guy. We didn't take any pictures of the random, but the picture jump-started my memory and made me instantly remember the weird random fire joiner. Either that or they looked identical to the same person. I'm a 20 year old male. This story takes place in Australia and happened sometime in January. I was starting my New Year's resolution of getting into shape and started to go for 20 minute jogs around my neighborhood every night. I was on day 20 or so of my jog and was getting used to the trail that I took every time. It was a concrete path that goes along a big lake and around outside of my suburb. Most of the path is surrounded by trees and a parkland. I would usually run at night at around 9pm because it's a lot cooler at night and I like the solitude. I would never see anyone at this time and I've only seen one or two people the whole time I've been doing it. It does get a little bit creepy, at times, as it is so dark. Usually the only light source being the moon, but I never felt scared while running. But this night was different. I was running through part of the trail that has some public exercise equipment off the side of it, so I decided to stop and use it to burn some extra calories. I would do this often during my run. This particular exercise machine was for exercising your chest and was attached to a machine for exercising shoulders. After I had done my first set, I had to take a little break to get my breath back. Still sitting at the machine, it was deadly quiet. All you could hear were the insects from the nearby lake. After a second, I heard someone sit down on the shoulder machine directly behind me. It scared me and I suddenly got an overwhelming feeling of dread and anxiety. I never get scared or nervous easily, but this creeped me out as I did not see anybody ahead of me on the trail before I sat down. I could see a good 50 meters ahead, so I would have seen someone coming. I also wondered why they wouldn't say hello or make themselves known to me. At this point, I noticed that all the insects in the area had gone quiet. This in itself creeped me out. I looked back to make sure someone was actually there and there was a bald headed man around 40 or 50 with perfect posture, just sitting in the shoulder machine, facing the opposite way from me. He wasn't wearing workout clothes and looked like he was wearing an old blazer. He kept looking forward and didn't acknowledge me at all. I'm a really logical person and something about this situation didn't add up in my mind. I thought to myself that this guy was a serial killer and that there was no reason whatsoever why he would just be sitting there. There is also a park bench about 5 meters away that he could have sat on if he wanted a normal seat, so it wasn't because of that. I turned around and did one more set as not to look freaked out. When I finished, I casually stood up and went to continue my jog and I noticed the man was gone. I looked all around and he wasn't anywhere to be seen. There were a few treads scattered around the park but other than that, there was nowhere else he could have gone at the time. I continued to jog up the path, partly hoping I could catch up to him, mainly because it would be better of him being behind me. I ran for 5 minutes and didn't see anyone. There was literally nowhere he could have gone unless he was hiding behind a tree or disappeared into thin air. After that I head home. To this day, I have no idea who the man was, but I have three theories. 1. The man was a weirdo, trying to get a rise out of people and purposely snuck up on me and sprinted away behind a tree. 2. He was a ghost haunting the area, which is why he was wearing old clothes. Also, the park is really old and was one of the first places settled in Western Australia. I don't believe in this one that much. 3. 
He was a normal guy out for a walk that stopped for a seat who didn't want to talk. Then it so happened to walk off trail through the park perfectly being covered by each tree as I ran, creating a continuous blind spot where I couldn't see him. I never went to that park again. I now run at the gym and won't be going back to that trail anytime soon. This happened when my dad was 16, all the way back in 1976. Him and my uncle Nigel were very outgoing and liked to explore to keep themselves occupied. When the summer of 76 came around, my dad finished school. He wanted to do one big bit of adventuring before he began work. The Pennine Way For those who do not know, the Pennine Way is a 270 mile walkway in Britain that, depending on which way you walk, starts in just south of Scotland and basically cuts through the middle of England and finishes in the Midlands. It usually takes around a three to four a week walk. With a long summer to fill, my dad and 15 year old uncle Nigel and my dad's friend Russ were dropped off in Scotland by my great grandfather to begin their hike. The first week went swimmingly. They met some nice locals who even cooked them food and gave them room to sleep in and generally enjoyed this whole new level of freedom entrusted upon them. They mainly camped in clear areas, but one day, they decided to cover an extra five miles in order to reach a village as they needed to buy some more food and get spare tents. They stumbled into a village around 6 p.m. and saw the local pub was opening. After relaxing in the pub with some drinks, my dad tells me that the owner probably knew they were underage, but wanted all the business they could get. The owner offered to let the guys camp out in the back field of their pub. The landlady slash wife said the owner seemed oddly hesitant at first, looking a bit concerned and having a bit of a word with her husband in private. However, Yorkshire hospitality seemed to override any doubt she had after a night of heavy drinking with the locals. They resided to their tent. My dad says they were using an oil lantern hooked to a center of the tent as a light source, and when they turned it off, they left it hanging which is important, not only for what happened next, but also what happened the next day. My dad woke up and turned off the oil light while debating to get up and having a piss in the field, seeming as the owners had been nice in letting them camp out there, when he heard a door creak open from the creek shut. There were no footsteps, so my dad had to put it down to an old shed or something. After a few seconds, however, the sound of feet landing on grass became progressively audible until they stopped right outside the tent. My dad thought it was the owner checking in on us, and he went to unzip the tent. The owner fully unzipped it. My dad said the weird thing about this was that he didn't have a shirt on, just some slippers and night trousers. After my dad asked what he was doing, he stuttered out some excuse about hearing a growl and went to check if the boys were okay and safe. There was no growl as the only sound in the last five minutes was the door the footsteps, and the unzipping of the tent. The guy weirdly emphasized the need for a good sleep before hiking and intrusively tapped on the oil light, asking for it to be turned off. He walked off, letting off a frustrated sigh and nearing the house and closed the door behind him. Morning comes and the owner's wife makes the boys some breakfast while they pack up their stuff. The owner takes down the tent for them and takes off somewhere in his 4x4 without coming back to the house. They thank the woman and tell her husband, thank you as well. She says that when she figures out when he comes back, that he will tell him. They come to their designated camping spot, just next to a small stream, around an hour and a half early and decide to have a longer rest after walking around 130 to 140 miles over the past eight to nine days. They pull out the tent and find lots of small holes, all about a pen's width and wide. What's weird about this is my dad described the size of it as holding a pen while telling me this. Everyone looks confused, and my dad rationalizes this by the man telling him about an animal last night. It must have come back and nibbled on the tent. Yes, uh, that explains it, sure. Russ suggests they walk back to a different village around two miles back and try to get another tent. They leave the now useless tent as a marker for their sight and walk back to the village. Their luck. A shop clearly targeting walkers is open.
unfortunately, they didn't have any tents, but they decided to buy tape and cover the holes for tonight, and hoped to find a new tent somewhere soon. When walking back, the sun had begun to set and it was quite dark. Moonlight mainly guiding them back down the path, when they returned to their sight, they couldn't believe it. Their tent was set up for them, but it was on fire, completely engulfed in flames. They threw the water in their bottles over the tent and used the stream water to fill them and eventually doused the fire. When they looked inside the tent, their oil lamp glass had been smashed and someone had followed them, set up their tent, and waited for them to return before smashing the oil lamp and, in turn, lighting up the tent in flames. My dad told me that there really is an explanation except for the pub owner. He was stopping doing whatever he was planning on doing with my dad being awake and decided to take some fucked up form of revenge by sending a message. At first, I totally didn't believe my dad and thought he was trying to scare me, but upon referencing the burning tent incident in a phone to my Uncle Nigel, he instantly started rambling about how weird it was. My Uncle Nigel does not lie. Background. We're at an Airbnb in Washington State, not far from Mount Rainer National Park. Our Airbnb host was outside on her horse pasture feeding her horse. We all went outside to greet her and thank her for accommodating us. She lived across the street, so she offered to show us her other property, with more horses and a few other farm animals. We passed her house, and now in her backyard, our host, let's call her Michelle, gets us in a circle and whispers, So, do you guys want to go back home with a story? Intrigued, we say yes. We had no idea what we were in for. She takes us past one of her two barns, and we walk into a wooded backyard, along with a foot trail that she takes her horses on daily. About 100 feet in, she stops us. Look down, she says. We see what appears to be a footprint, yet wider and longer than that of a human's. It was especially long, so whoever left the print must have slipped in the mud. There were toe imprints as well. She then began to tell us that this imprint was made by none other than a Sasquatch. While huddled around the imprint, she tells us how she got her house and then her second property across the street, our Airbnb. You might think I'm crazy, but if I knew about their existence, I would have never moved here. Do you want to see more? Of course, we, a group of four 20-something year olds, do. So Michelle takes us further down the path. At this point, I was feeling a bit uncertain about what was coming or about to happen. Hair stood up on my arms and I got the chills. I kid you not, seconds later Michelle says to us, right about this point, here's where you might feel some chills or your hair sticking up. She was spot on there, and I was feeling uneasy, and I didn't really want to go forward, yet we walk a little bit further down the path. They had asked me to bring you guys here, they wanted to say hello, Michelle told us. I've never brought any of my guests back here before, but it seemed important to show this to you guys. We had no idea if we were going to see anything, as it was getting darker and darker out. We stopped for some more conversation, when Michelle stopped us from talking. Shh. We didn't hear anything. We're all still quiet, when Michelle asked us something peculiar. Have any of you lost a brother recently, or have any of you experienced psychic abilities? We all say no, it felt a little awkward and we moved on. We go to the last point in our walk and she was astonished. She laid some sticks down earlier in the day and the arrangement of sticks had changed. They're always mischievous and like to move things around and mess with us, Michelle explained. She also says saying how she left a deceased chicken right at that spot and it was gone. The Sasquatch people must have taken them. She said she often leaves them gifts, usually food, and then they're gone before she knows it. At this point, I'm feeling skeptical about all of this. I'm not a believer, but I also didn't have any reason not to believe any of this. We were all quiet, and out of nowhere we hear a noise far back into the woods. It sounded like an owl's hoot, 
but very, very far away. Michelle said, oh, that's just an owl. But then she took it back when we heard the next noise. I can't recreate the noise in person, nor can I recreate it in my head, but I'll do my best to describe it. It sounded like a monkey's ooh-ooh-ah mixed with the laugh of a hyena. Michelle assured us that they meant no harm, and that that was definitely them talking to us. She yells back in English to greet them, because they can understand our language as well. We head back to the Airbnb and talk about nothing other than our experience for no less than two hours. While drinking, of course. I'm with my best friends and one of them makes it their mission to go back into the woods to search for the Squatch himself. The other tags along, but I stay back because I didn't really want much to do with it. They leave and I go grab a joint to smoke and go out on the deck. It was silent, nothing but me, the cabin, and the beautiful Washington State wilderness. Then I heard it again. The same owl hoot in the distance, followed by the eerie sounding monkey noises. I was alone and stayed up there for an hour until my friend returned and told them I heard it again, yet strangely, they didn't. I was backpacking in Arkansas. The Eagle Rock Loop in the Washita National Forest. There is a section of the trail that goes through an area called the Albert Pike Recreation Area. In June of 2010, a flash flood killed 20 people, including men, women, and children. There's a ton of stories online about this event if you want to look it up. So I start my trip at Little Missouri Falls, going counterclockwise. It's 26 miles with some pretty good climbs. You can find a map of the loop on Google Images. So I hiked a fairly long day. If you Google Eagle Rock Loop Map, you will find a basic sketch map, not the topo map, just one of the basic ones with the labels of the trails, mountains, and water crossings on Pinterest. At the bottom of the map, there is a single water drop with a yellow circle around it. This just means it's always a wet crossing. There are several yellow circled water drops. The single one at the very bottom right next to the Viles Branch Trail. That is exactly where I was camped, so anyone can go there if you want to look it up and see what I'm talking about. So, that is the Little Missouri River. The water is flowing away from Albert Pike. I'm maybe four to five miles downstream from where the flash flood occurred. I don't know if this is significant or not to my story, but I'm not ruling it out either. I set up camp at about 4 p.m. for the day. This was November of last year. Fairly cold nights, it was about 26 degrees the night before. I was expecting another cold night in the high 20s. Not a lot of movement around there that night when it was cold. Most animals hunker down. I use a tarp where both ends are open. I have an inflatable sleeping pad and my 35 degree sleeping bag. Now, I'm set up on completely level ground. On my pad, on the tarp inside my sleeping bag, I quickly fall asleep around 10 p.m. after sitting around the fire. Everything is normal all evening, and all night for the most part. Now, you know when you're asleep and you fall in your dream? You get that sensation like you're falling in real life when you tense up and always wake up on impact. Okay. Well, I was asleep and I get the sensation sort of where I feel like I'm being dragged out of my tarp by my feet. Except it wasn't by my feet, I was being pulled by my sleeping bag. Like my whole pad with me in it suddenly being dragged out quickly. I woke suddenly as it startled me. Keep in mind, it was really cold. Low 30s to high 20s at this point. And I have a 35 degree sleeping bag. So I'm inside my bag all the way with the top closed off by a shock cord. I'm completely inside my bag covered to stay warm. Now, I'm wide awake and listening for any movement. Everything is still and quiet, except for the river next to me, obviously. That is the only sound I can hear. I didn't peek out my head. I just laid there awake and listening. I sat there for a good 15 minutes listening for any sound outside of the river. I never heard anything. Granted, the river is pretty loud being right there but there was no movement around my camp at all. So I chalked it up to having that falling sensation when you dream. 
I figured I must have been dreaming about something and it made me feel like that I fell or something. I went to sleep for 30 or 45 minutes longer, still keeping my ears open but figuring I was probably just dreaming. So for the most part, I just shrugged it off and put my mind off of it and got back to sleep. Morning comes and I get up and put my shoes on and run out of bed. I head straight over to the fire to pit it and still get the fire for first thing because it's definitely cold outside at 6.30am this morning. I turn back towards my tarp and head over to get my food hanging close by. That's when I noticed it and I froze. My pad and sleeping bag at the foot end are sticking out from under my tarp by a good foot and a half at least. I can think about how now as I felt being dragged out from under my tarp the night before staring at how my bed is from under the tarp. I slowly approach the tarp and look for any sort of footprints. The problem is I don't even see my own because the ground is so compact around there. I double check and I'm not in any sort of slope at all. The ground is completely flat. I really have no idea how this happened and I know I was startled awake by that sensation of swiftly sliding down the hill towards my feet. My pad with me in it was being dragged out. I quickly had breakfast, packed up and headed out. I was supposed to spend one more night on the trail, but the longer I hiked the more I thought that what would happen the next night. These thoughts running in my head the entire day as I walked. Could it have been another person? I, I didn't hear anything. Why would anyone do that to anyone else? How could I have slid down so far? Maybe it was an animal. It couldn't have been. There were no punctures in my mattress and there were no footprints anywhere. Did I just slide throughout the night with restless sleep? It doesn't make any sense. I normally sleep on a slight incline and I've never slid outside of the tarp before. Was this paranormal? I'm not far from Albert Pike. Could this have been some sort of ghost trying to save me from a flash flood horror that it was reliving over and over? All day long, the same things were running through my head. I ended up hiking to my car and sleeping in there that night. The Athens Big Fort Trail was very tough going up over six mountains. It was almost dark after I descended the last one. I hiked the last three or so miles by headlamp in the dark. I wasn't keen on sleeping on the trail another night after that. Truth is, I've been on that trail a ton and will for sure go back. I've been all over Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, and Colorado. Around 750 miles and countless nights spent in the woods all over the place. I almost exclusively hike solo. I never carry a gun or bear spray. I don't carry a SAT phone or GPS transponder. That is the only weird and unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me regarding camping, backpacking, and the outdoors. It started several years ago. My and my friend's interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which was when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom, so we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and we're especially drawn to the element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure as hell that if we were going in any old building in the dark, that we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. But we never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was really chilly. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB era, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I could only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. This is common, featuring among old hospitals. We have been inside there quite a few times. What was picking our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to the hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead, had to hop over a tall wall and climb over a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water, 
so nothing too heavy for valuable that would get damaged when we tossed it over the obstacle before us. A little ways off the road, it was dark. If you clung to the buildings, you did it for a while before stepping behind a patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way to the first wall since the only way to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in the corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain to be the last over that wall. It was too high up for me to jump and haul myself over, so I restored to stepping on a pipe, jutting out somewhere lower among the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over. Moving into the library's courtyard, another girl and I waited for our two friends to get over and join us. Upon an initial glance over the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain which I took joy in imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months. People laughing and talking and the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15 foot chain link fence directly in front of us separating the courtyard in half. I could tell you it hadn't seen the same weather at the rest of the courtyard because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground and rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third one over because I have a slight fear of climbing and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, and then I sat atop of it, straddling it with my leg on either side. I was thinking that had to have been one of the scariest things I have ever been done in a while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't ever compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground, and all four of us split up in a smaller half of the courtyard looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could really get cut up, so that wasn't an option. Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a gate near the base of where the walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside there was another drop down where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small, squared landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked among ourselves wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down here, she said. Wait, where? I can see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to take out a step, but I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight permitted and too dark. Hello? She called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine and it was as if the feel of darkness radiating out of that hole in the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet and the darkness had spilled out and weighed all over us. He said, in what I can only describe as a lustful tone, dripping with all intent, I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath, unease, and something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat, like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was, and said lowly, that's not cool. The man under the dark earth began laughing maniacally, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does, in the way that you could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in the gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple of seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there, and now. I was not about to risk some nutcase coming after us, even if we did not 
The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. 15 foot potential fall, and I didn't even take the time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were halfway down the street, down the block, and out of breath. I can still hear that laugh. About two years ago, on a summer day, my dad and I went for a quick hike on the hills that overlook our city. On the hills there are many reservoirs, many of which are surrounded by the swoods of fir trees, and are places of great beauty and quiet usually. The particular reservoir we were hiking to provided us wonderful views of the city and we knew the route well. However, since we had been hiking in the late afternoon we only had an hour or so before dust set in. We decided to walk fast. We trekked up the pebble path from the bump gate that loops around the reservoir. You can't actually see the water until you scaled a small mound in front first. Well, Dad and I were nearing the mound, heading towards the water, when things got really strange. This man, probably in his 20s, was running barefooted and shirtless along the mound from one side to the other, back and forth, back and forth, over and over again. Huh, I thought, that's odd. Yes, it was summer, but where I live, summer is not a guarantee of warmth. So, even though it was August, there was still a sharp chill in the air. Plus, we were quite a few feet up to the rush of winds, and have made it too cold to run half naked like this. Maybe he was doing it all for a thrill, or maybe he was hammered. We didn't stay long enough to find out. As we approached the water, a good distance from the odd runner, we could see the remnants of a fire ahead of some fir trees. Then ashes, sands, were littered in strips of burnt foil and realized there must have been some drug use here. We thought that might explain our runner friend over there. The man was utterly oblivious to us, so we passed by and he seemed harmless enough. But when we were behind the woods, climbing over the rocky pathway, we saw another man stumbling and blinking like a drunk. His clothes were filthy. His general appearance was unkept. He looked rough and he'd probably been sleeping that way too. Perhaps he'd even been camping on the hills. I was a little uncertain to be honest. This man stank of alcohol, seemed to be doused in stuff, and he was grumbling to himself as he lumbered by. I worried that he was drunk enough to give us a hassle, perhaps even follow us about. He looked at me oddly, in a way that made me extremely uncomfortable, and I just wanted him to get away from me. Thankfully, he passed us slowly without any issue. I started to breathe normally again, but I was still on high alert. When we came around the reservoir through another bump gate, we noticed that the runner was gone. I didn't understand this as I'd only seen him five minutes ago or so, so I looked around and tried to spot the man himself or his clothes as I was curious about him. He'd been acting really weird, like he was completely out of it. So I was peering through trees, trying to peek over the reservoir mound. I even looked behind me, up onto the hill in case he had snuck by us it was climbing up and I didn't see him. We were passing through the gap between some trees and I was looking into the woods to see if I could find the runner between the firs, but then I saw something and stopped. And not just something, but someone. Someone sitting amongst the trees with dark eyes and face. Eyes that glared at me. What the hell? I was close enough to see that the lurker was a man. His clothes were baggy and his hair was long. I couldn't see his face too well, but I could see his mouth open and I stared closely. It was like he was snarling at me, like a vicious animal. I was thinking to myself, what the fuck is he doing in the trees? He was crouching about 50 feet from us, quiet and alone. It occurred to me that he may have been the runner, but I soon realized that it couldn't have been the runner, because the runner returned, jogging along the mound about a minute later. The drunk we had passed had gone in another direction and I hadn't seen anybody else up there so it was really creepy to just see this person sitting there, lurking amongst the trees. I tried to pretend that I hadn't seen the creeper in the woods and continued walking. My heart rate was accelerating and my head gathered a cool sweat. The thought of him just watching us made me shiver. At least, my dad was with me. Walking back seemed to take an age and my nerves made it difficult to move. I was tempted to look back around, but I didn't want him to know that I'd seen him in case he'd panicked and took action. It was getting pretty dark now and Mr. Lurker about twice as scary, so I wanted to get away from them all. All the weirdos, even the seemingly harmless ones. 
Back in the car, I told my dad about the man in the trees. He hadn't seen them. I don't know if my dad truly believed me. Perhaps he felt like I was exaggerating and the supposed malicious intent on the creep's face. But I swear he was scowling and snarling slightly at me. It was freaky. I'd never gone to this part of the hills late again due to this experience. It is truly a beautiful spot and I love going there, but I guess you could say it's pretty dodgy around dusk. On August 5th, 2001, on US Highway 287, which is 31 miles west of Palestine, Texas, I was traveling westbound at 65 miles per hour when I saw what looked like a bear cub or a very large dog sitting in the middle of the road. I slowed down to 15 miles per hour. I hit my high beams and stopped about 20 yards away from the animal. I put on my four-way flashers, turned on my interior spotlight. As I looked up, I saw a huge bipedal creature that I will call Bigfoot. It walked from the soft shoulder of the road to the animal in the road. As he, I am pretty sure it was a male, walked in front of my tractor, he shielded his eyes, not seemingly out of shyness, but more as an effort to protect his eyes from the bright lights. I reduced my headlights to a low beam, but decided not to turn them off as I was in the middle of the highway. I was doing my best to protect them by blocking the road with my tractor trailer. The big male went over to what I realized was a toddler. He grabbed his shoulder and attempted to grab the little one's arm. The little one scooted away like a child trying to get away from a parent that wants the child to go somewhere and the child doesn't want to go. The little one had greater agility than the big male. The little one squirmed, scrambled, and scooted further up the road where they were. Then something caught my eye and ear directly next to my driver's window. I casually looked over, and within two feet of my face was a female. No doubt female. She had nursing breasts and extended nipples. Her eyes were almost even with my eye level. I measured it from where the top of her head came up to my mirror. It was seven foot, four inches tall. The male was at least one foot taller than her, plus some. She had a gamey smile, but it didn't stink. Immediately upon seeing her, I smiled with all the teeth I have. From the interior spotlight, which was pointed down toward my lap, I am sure she was able to see me clearly. I certainly saw her clearly. So clearly, I could smell her and feel her breath. I particularly noticed the volume of air that she breathed. Not out of breath or even heavy breathing, just a large volume of air with each breath. I again smiled at her and asked, is the baby okay? She slowly smiled back at me. I noticed a dental anomaly. Either she had a double row of teeth, or the crowns of her teeth were split on the top center to give the impression of two rows of teeth. She then reached into the tractor and stroked my beard, like I do when I'm thinking. My beard is mid-chest length and multicolored. It was then I realized the large male's head was identical to mine, although his beard was shorter. The female had thin facial hair on her chin. The rest of his fur was dark brown with traces of gray and white on his shoulders, back and chest. She was a mixture of brown and reddish fur, mostly reddish brown. As she took her hand off my beard and took her hand out of my tractor, I extended my hand out to her. She sandwiched my hand between her two hands and her two hands were easily two to three times bigger than mine. Her hands felt like roughneck work gloves or rough leather. At this point, she gave me a soulful look. From her facial expressions and her watery eyes, I took what she was saying, thank you for not running over my baby. The eyes were not dead eyes, they were bright and moist, just very dark brown, but not black. The large male had the child under his arm, like a sack of potatoes. He never looked directly at me as I watched him walk back into the tree line. I noticed at least three more, I suspected even more, at the tree line. They ranged from the height of a female to slightly shorter, but none came close to the size of the male. 